No matter who you are and where you are on life's journey, you are welcome to worship here with us. Oh, today is a very special day. What day is today? It's our 275th birthday. How many people know how many people actually started this church on this day 275 years ago? Now, this is actually a tricky, tricky question, but technically... How many people were documented as starting the church? Five. I say it's a tricky question because they say five men. Because, yeah. So we'll call it ten. (laughs) We'll call it ten. (laughs) So ten people started this church 275 years ago today. Today is our actual birthday. And so, my friends, that is quite a celebration. If we look back on the life of the church, I'm positive we could find times when people went, Oh my gosh, we can't afford the oil bill. And there were times when they went, Oh my gosh, we can afford our oil bill and 18 people's oil bills. So, my friends, the life of the church is always in flux, and yet we're here, 275 years later. Few housekeeping. Our prayer chain is growing. I do have some more paper in my office, but we will be cutting more paper. If you have paper at home and you have your things on it, please bring them in. We will add them and link them together, and we will have more paper available. Our um, daily devotionals, Lenten, uh, yeah, we're not in Lent yet. Our Advent daily devotionals and Advent calendars are printed and downstairs in packets. Should we run out, just let us know. We will print more. Speaking of Advent, next Saturday is the annual moving of the creche for the front lawn and decorating of the sanctuary. If you are available... We, we do need more hands um, to help move it and set it up and then set up in here. If you are available, please email, call, contact Karen Gullman and let her know that you are available. Are there any more announcements? Oh, I was the person who sent out the weekly email And I am sorry that I didn't switch the bulletin and the wrong bulletin was in there. That was on me. I am sorry. Are there any more announcements related to the faith in order of our amazing 275-year-old church? I do. Oh, sorry. See? It's because I can't actually see you. It's a very awkward spot. Don't sit here. <laughs> We've had discussions about this pew. <laughs> Our amazing Liz Ger- Reverend Liz Garrigan Byerly, who is, and I never get your title right, I'm sorry. Executive Minister for Area Conference Who is the Southern New England Conference of the United Church of Christ's Executive Minister of Area Conference Ministry, is here with us today to celebrate with us to represent the conference, and we do know that Reverend Durrell, we are all aware, was going to come, and he is coming on January 7th to celebrate with us. Liz is here this morning. She's going to give us an amazing sermon and help with our communion this morning. But we have a few gifts for Liz. So Liz, if you could come up. Sorry, Reverend Liz. Reverend Liz and I have worked together for four years now. So, Reverend Liz, we are Belltown. Um, we, East Hampton is where the first sleigh bells in America mm-hmm. were made, and the, the factory does still exist here, um, for, run by the Bevan Bell Company. They had a, when was the fire? Because it was before my time. How 
while ago they had a fire that destroyed most of the factory. The cast for this bell was found in the remains of the factory, and so they casted these bells for us. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. And a real treasure in our, time, in our town is the Black Walnut Bakery. And so we cannot send <laughs> representatives. Bells and bakeries, why not, right? This is pumpkin pie bread baked this morning at the Black Walnut. Special for you. Thank you. You're welcome. Enjoy to be here. Thank you. And so, my friends, as we come into our time of celebration and joy, let us take a deep breath. Settle in, let us hear the sounds of the hum of our heat, of the rustling of papers, and the feel of love and joy as we enter into worship. join me for the call to worship. Beautiful are the works of God. Beautiful also are the skins of the God's people. Beautiful is the mind of God. Beautiful also are the hopes of God's people. Beautiful is the heart of God. Beautiful also are the souls of God's people. God made the heavens and the earth. To God be the glory of the things God has done.
please join me for the unison prayer of invocation and the Lord's Prayer. Spirit of love, spirit of truth, guide us as we pray to think and wish and pray the best and mean the words we say. Hushed is our quiet room, still in this place of prayer. Silent, we bow our heads and feel your presence. Amen. Let us now pray together the prayer Jesus Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and give us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
falling like the fall. It wants to go with you. It can't. No more leaves in my house. One of the greatest joys our congregation has is this. It is the time of passing of the peace. When you all just get so excited to see one another, I just can't contain you. <laughs> and yet every week we come, we come together with joys and concerns, hopes and sorrows. So let's do a compliment sandwich this week. Let's start with a few joys, we'll go to concerns, and then we'll end with a few joys. How's that? Joys! I got one! Josie turned 14 yesterday. <laughs> we, we, I accidentally ran into Josie in the red door. And as I walked through the door, I went, oh, Josie, happy birthday. And the entire store started singing happy birthday to her. <laughs> Alka. know when his birthday is, but this week he is turning 14, 13, 13. Any more birthdays this week, or like in the, in the past few weeks? All right. Yes. Uh, I, my aunt, turned 99 on Thursday. Wow. And, um, so yeah, I'm going to be That is a big... 99. It's almost like turning 13 again. <laughs> Another joy. Abby, you got a joy. I know you do. I just saw you talking. Oh, well, I love you too. And your mom. Joy. I saw a hand. All right. Hold the rest. What concerns do we come with today? Yes. The young woman that I've been asking for prayers for. Prayers for continued prayers for Kim's friend who is on the road to recovery, um, but it is a long journey. Cindy. Uh, first, my mother was 95. Uh, that her, her health is starting to fail. So she's, you know, prayers for her. Prayers for Cindy's mom as her health is 95. <laughs> yes. Prayers for Christine's nephew and his wife, and anyone navigating difficult and hard pregnancies. Yes. Prayers for Alka as she navigates her health concerns, new medications, and the process of being in a new moment. More joys. Yes. Joys for having Thanksgiving with family and chaotic Zoom meetings uh, with the rest of my family. And the fact that we have Wi-Fi so we can do it. Joys for Wi-Fi, for chaotic Zoom meetings with family on Thanksgiving, and to be present to family on Thanksgiving. Yes. 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 Uh huh. And she 
How many? But you're only 50. <laughs> Joyce, that we have longtime members like Mary who are able to join us today. Yes. That is perfectly okay. Stand up. You can stand on the pew. Go ahead. What type of dog takes a bath? I don't know. A shampoo. A shampoo. <laughs> Texted me yesterday and said that she bought a a, a sham a a a, 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 sh, a she poodle so, some sort of dog that sounds like that <laughs> and it's a really fluffy dog. So, <laughs> Abby, you're awesome. You're all awesome. My friends, please join me in prayer. Oh, holy God. We want to thank you for this day. We want to thank you for bestowing the Holy Spirit into this community 275 years ago. And we want to thank you for the opportunity for this community, this congregation, to be keeper of your light, to let it shine bright in this community, to let this particular little sort of section of your creation glowing with light and love, letting all of those who pass by know that they are welcome here, no matter where they are on their journey, no matter who they are or who they love, they are welcome in your kingdom. And we thank you for the honor of that stewardship. We ask that you hear prayers for those who are healing, those who are ill, those who are aging, and those who are in new times in their lives. We ask that you hold those starting new families in untraditional ways and to those who are struggling with pregnancies that are challenging. We ask that you be with all of those who are in war-torn countries, those refugees, those trying to flee into safety, be with them. Help them find strength and love. Be with the leaders of the world. Soften their hearts and help them to work toward the best for all people so that this world may begin to find peace and reconciliation. And, O oh holy God, we want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts for the joy of just being family together, for really funny jokes and moments of laughter. All this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. The scripture for today is Philippians 1, 3 through 11. I thank you, God, every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray for joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it to the completion until the day of, Je of Christ Jesus. 
It is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart and whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless in the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. May the Lord God add a blessing to the hearing and reading of these holy words. Amen. you Congregational Church in East Hampton. It really is truly a delight and privilege to be here with you today. Those words that Jackie read from Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, um, I wanted you to think, I should have told you this beforehand, think about them as words from the wider church to you today. Because Paul would have written them in that sense. Paul liked to use the royal I language, if you want to think about it that way, the royal we. He wrote on behalf of the apostles, on behalf of all the churches across the Roman Empire, whether they knew it or not, he was writing on their behalf. And as I chose this that scripture for you this morning, I imagined it as the wider church's prayer and blessing to you. I bring you greetings from the wider church, from Reverend Darrell Goodwin, our executive conference minister, who will be with you on Epiphany Sunday. From your area conference minister, Reverend Isaac Lawson, and the entire Southern New England staff, board of directors, the Middlesex Association. And I want to thank you on behalf of the wider church for your partnership in ministry with us. Through your proportional giving to the conference and the national setting and the Middlesex Association, through your participation in conference events and your support of your pastor being a delegate to General Synod this past summer, for your prayers and shared ministries and all of the ways you join with us in living the love and justice of Jesus. It is so good to be in covenant with you. 26,457 gallons of milk collected and 5,210 pounds of cheese made from it. 61 tomato steaks pounded in the ground in June, and 31 removed unbroken in October. 12 softball games with 8 home runs. 26 guests receiving financial aid. 12 of them moving on to independent living. 2,179 gallons of maple sap collected only 259 of which leaked out all over the shoes of those who collected them. These are just some of the examples of what might have been shared at a Thanksgiving harvest report at Gould Farm. In my early 20s, I had the honor of working and living at Gould Farm, which is a therapeutic community for adults with mental illness. Nestled on 750 acres of woods and fields in western Massachusetts, the farm combines clinical care, community, and meaningful work to enable guests, which is what we call those receiving treatment, the ability to find recovery from and manage their significant mental illnesses. Thanksgiving is the major holiday at the farm. I was on the team responsible for setting up the very small old spaces for 100 guests, and it was always a puzzle to fit them all in. And while people come for the community and the food, the harvest reports really steal the show every year. 
Every work team at the farm, from kitchen to clinical, farm to garden, the cafe to forestry and grounds, gives a harvest report after the meal is over. Creativity and humor are strongly encouraged, and reports range from skits to songs to poems. And while not required, almost all of them end up doing some kind of number accounting like I started this sermon with. But the numbers themselves never really mattered, as much as what they represented. They represent countless minutes of learning to function while managing mental health symptoms. Countless hours of not being stigmatized or shunned. Countless days contributing to community and countless weeks finding peace, connection, and meaning in everyday life. Countless ripples of healing and wholeness spreading through individuals, families, and communities. Just imagine your harvest report, Congregational Church of East Hampton. The number of Sunday worships that have happened in this location over 275 years, which give or take a few off Sundays for pandemics and wars, would roughly be 14,300. The thousands and thousands of miles you have traveled to mission trips to South Dakota and beyond. The literal tons of food you have collected and distributed through the town food pantry. And the thousands of volunteer hours dedicated to collecting, organizing, and distributing it. The number of plum puddings you shared at your annual festival and perhaps the number that were just secretly put in the trash afterwards, never eaten. The pieces of confetti that are still found in your radiators and your carpet a month after Easter. The hugs and meals shared with each other in times of grief, illness, and celebration. The number of jokes told in worship. What a harvest! you have brought in, church. I'm sure that this year of reflecting and celebrating your anniversary has brought up all sorts of memories and recollections. So much to celebrate. So much of which you should and can be proud. Even some tender spots. But tender spots in which you found the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit. What things would you like to add to this harvest port report now? You don't have to know the exact number. You can just estimate or give the category. What things should we add to this harvest list? The number of baptisms and weddings. Pumpkin breads made for the food pantries. Thousands of hymns and songs sung by the congregation. Fairs. The fairs. I don't even know how you would tally up the amount of time and energy that people have poured into church fairs. Dinners shared. Thousands and thousands, maybe even millions of stitches in all of those sh shawls, prayer shawls, scarves, hats. These lovely little packets that you have in your pews. This is the first time I've ever seen that at a church, and they're wonderful. We could go on and on, and I hope that afterwards in the reception you will have a chance to continue to share them with you. Echo with each other. Echoing Paul's words. I and the entire body of Christ thank God for you every day. And we pray with you for all the ways that you partner with us in the gospel. We are confident that the one who began this good work in you will continue until all time is complete. So what's the point? What's the point of tallying up all these numbers that represent our labor and impact? Why collect memories and stories and share them with each other? 
There are a lot of reasons, actually. The ones that stand out to me most are gratitude, perspective, community, and the future. For many of us, those are the reasons we choose to come to church week after week. Being part of a community grants us gratitude. It strengthens our experience of it and our practice. It's a place where we come to step away from the world and gain perspective. And it's fundamental to our sense of community. But we, the church as a body, the body of Christ itself, needs these things just as much as the individuals who grace our doorsteps do. So I want you to think now about yourself as this body. Because we, the church, need to feel and express deep gratitude to God, who calls us forth into this world, who entrusts us with the ongoing ministry of Jesus, and accompanies us as we carry it out. That experience of gratitude strengthens our relationship with God and the entire body of Christ. And we, the church, need perspective just as much as each of us individually do, so that we can lift our eyes from our daily reality. Many churches, not only in the Southern New England Conference, but across our denomination and across what we can traditionally call the mainline church, these days are struggling to find enough volunteers. Our pews in our Sunday school classrooms don't look like they did when we remember them from years past. For many of our churches, stewardship and fundraisers are not keeping up with the costs of being the church. We can get caught in just seeing what is not enough and lamenting what was in the previous decades without being able to step back and remember that the church of the 20th century has really been an anomaly, not the norm in terms of the Christian church. Gathering a perspective as the body of Christ allows us to situate ourselves more in God's time instead of our time. In God's time where mountain ranges are born and grow old and diminish. Where the life of one man from a small backwater town gone now from the earth for almost 2,000 years continues to resonate and reverberate around the globe. That's God's time, church. We need to see ourselves in it. And we, the church, need community. We need to be in relationship with other churches and other members of the body of Christ who share our mission and our faith, who can support us and whom we can support. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ has never been just ours. It hasn't been just ours to proclaim or uphold in this time or place or anywhere. Indeed, we cannot do it alone. We need each other. But perhaps the most important reason to do any kind of harvest report is our very future. After all, the point of a harvest is literally to provide for the future. We don't gather up grains and vegetables, fruits and meats, and preserve them simply to honor the past. We do it to literally nurture and keep us alive for the future. Recognizing our harvests and celebrating them does the same thing for us, church. The only reason you have memory at all, says neuroscientist and writer David Eagleman, is so that you can navigate the future. Memories are our brain's way of holding on to important information and learning so that we can literally survive and thrive. Now, every once in a while, it's a literal blueprint. Ouch, I remember touching that hot stove as a kid and I will never do it again. But more often than not, our memories translate meaning and purpose. 
value, and imagination. The same is true not only for us individually, but for us as the body of Christ. So I'm going to go back and pick on those plum pudding festivals again. Your fond memories of those don't mean that you need to bring back the plum pudding. But your memories remind you that you value generosity and connection with each other with a large dash of playfulness. So what do those values mean for your future? For the ways you want to continue to build community among yourselves and also among those who have never known that history and that memory. The history of your church is deeply tied to this town. From its colonial foundings as an establishment to the Bell Factory. Indeed, it is still the gifts that you give your visitors. But that doesn't mean your mission is tied to the form of government of this town or its economic structure. It does mean that your mission is tied to the very lives and needs of those who call this home. From your food pantry, to your medical equipment loans, to meaningful engagement for your youth, you are finding what your community needs now and bringing the light and love of Jesus to them. What will that mean for how you continue to stretch to serve this ever-evolving and changing community in the years to come? A newer memory that you've created is using these beautiful and amazing homemade apple cider donuts and apple cider and apples for communion. It is such a creative way of honoring the original ritual, which was to take the most fundamental and common elements that people broke, used to eat together and through the blessing of God elevate them to something sacred. It's exactly what you're doing now that Jesus did then. Because you're taking what is literally of the ground here and bringing it into the divine. So what does this mean for your future? Does it mean that every creative gesture will include apples? No. <laughs> of course not. But the memories you are creating now will be a catalyst for the next time you want to infuse new life and meaning into your communal moments. Our memories, our harvests, our histories are precious. Not as fragile objects that we place high on the shelf of honor to be seen and admired, but not touch lest we break them. They are precious as reminders of our core values, as guides along the way when we face an unknown path, as fuel for our futures. Your future Congregational Church of East Hampton will not be a repeat of the past. The world in which you find yourself has changed and will continue to change. And you will need to continue to adapt to it. But your harvests can and will guide you. Because your ancestors in faith, in this town and all the way back to Philippi, have been doing that all along. Being resurrected and recreated by God over and over and over again. My closing prayer for you as you step into this next chapter of your life echoes Paul's words to that early church. I pray that your love may overflow more and more with the knowledge and full insight so that you can determine what really matters, so that your decisions about the future will be authentic to you and pleasing to God so that you can continue to produce a harvest of righteousness, a harvest of goodness and justice, of grace and reconciliation, of love and joy, 
until the mission of Jesus Christ is complete. May it be so. Amen. This little joy I have, the world didn't give it to me, but God did, and I'm so joyous to be the minister of such an amazing church. As we come into our time of offering, let us give graciously of what we have received this week, so that the love of Christ may move forward in our community and in our world. Let us enter into a time of offering. God, bless these gifts so that they may grow in abundance and so our harvest can continue today, tomorrow, and forevermore. Be with us, O oh God, as we move forward into a world that is beautifully loved by you. Amen. God loves us, and God's love has sustained yeah. us not for judgment and oppression, but rather for hope, for peace, and for justice. Therefore, my friends, let us confess our sins together. Loving, Loving God, God, we, we confess, confess that we, that have, we have sinned, sinned against, against you. By not, by not honoring, honoring you or one another, when we, we place your injustices before you, it is your love that sheds light on our wayward deeds. As we stand in awe of your constancy for us, we ask your forgiveness through the mercy of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. 
My friends, when we acknowledge our human limitations in turn to depend upon the everlasting God, we grow wise in heart to God's commands. My friends, you are free to love and to be loved. Your sins are forgiven by the mercy of Christ. Amen. Amen. God be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to God. Let us give thanks to God. It is right to give thanks. Jesus said to his disciples, come and see. He didn't reference check them before extending the invitation. He didn't ask them a series of questions to prove themselves. He didn't quiz them on their temple attendance or their Torah knowledge. There was no prerequisite for his invitation. Friends, the same goes for you, for me, for all of us. Whether you have been coming to this table for years or it is your first time, you are invited here. Whether you come with a faith that could move mountains or a seedling size faith that still is still growing with care, you are welcome here. Whether you come from near or far, from east or west, you are invited here. And whether you come confident in the knowledge that you were made by God, or you are still seeking to trust that good news, you are invited here. All of you, all that you are, your faith, your doubt, your hope, your fear, all of you is invited here. We have an amazing story to tell all of you today. We think it's the greatest story ever told. <laughs> it is a story about compassion and mystery, grace and forgiveness, humility and unconditional love. If you've heard this story, if you've never heard this story before, I ask you to listen. What are you here today? And if you've heard this story before, I ask you to maybe put on a new hermeneutic. And what do you hear anew in this story in our time and place today? My friends, this is a story about a man named Jesus. You see, it was Passover. And Jesus had gathered in the upper room with his friends, the disciples. And as they sat around the table, Jesus raised his hands and he offered a prayer. Baruch Atah Adonai Elohim, praise you God Adonai, bless this bread and the fruit and the vine and bless us in our drinking and eating at this table. Strengthen us by this meal that we might be fed and made whole. In your precious name we pray. Amen. After that, Jesus took bread and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Even though his friends didn't really understand, they ate anyway. And later, after supper, he took a cup, again giving thanks, and he poured it out, saying to them, This is my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins, for you and for many. As often as you do this, remember me. And again, not fully understanding, they still drank together. Now, friends, there may be some of us here today who might not feel welcomed or worthy to come to this table. Maybe you have done something that you feel ashamed of, or you live with a, a label that the world has placed upon you. Perhaps you judge yourself 
too harshly or have been judged by the church in the past. But the truth of this table and the one who is in charge of it, Jesus Christ, is this. There is a place here for each and every one. There are no barriers or fences or boundaries. There is no membership card needed. And you don't even know how, need to know how to get a seat to be at this table. Jesus welcomed all to this table. And to make sure that there are no boundaries at this table, we today have cider donuts, apples, and simple cider. Because we do not want to turn anybody away for any reason. And now, my friends, if we go back to the story of the Last Supper for just a moment, we realize that when Jesus looked around the table that night, he saw his friends. Jesus knew that one would deny him. Jesus knew that eventually they would all turn their back. Jesus knew this, that they would all abandon him, but Jesus welcomed them all to the table anyway. And Jesus knew they didn't understand what he was talking about, but Jesus fed them at the table anyway. Jesus simply said, Come. Come. Because all you need to be, all you need to be to come to this table is hungry. Join me in a spirit of prayer. Oh God, we ask that you consecrate, therefore, by your Holy Spirit, these gifts of bread and cup, of donut and fruit of the earth that we may receive them at this table, that we may offer you our faith and praise, that we may be united by, with Christ and with one another as we partake. In the strength that Christ gives us, we offer ourselves to you, O God, and give thanks that you have called us to serve you. We thank you, God, for inviting us to this table where we have known the presence of Jesus and receive his gifts now. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and let us show forth your praise in our lives through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Jesus welcomes all to the table, and so do we. Ministering to you in the name of Christ, we invite you to this table today. We invite you all to come forward. Reverend Liz, you're going to take the bread? And I will take the cup. And so you will come to Reverend Liz first, and then to myself. And on your way back, you may sit and partake of your elements after a moment of reflection. If you are unable to come forward, and we understand that there are some, please just simply raise your hand and we will come to you. And so, my friends, come. Come, because all things are ready.
God invites us to love one another, to be in community with one another, and to nourish each other. Let us together say our unison prayer of thanksgiving. Loving God, God, we thank you you for all all that you have given given us us, and and praise you for your your astonishing goodness. goodness. Receive the dedication of our hearts, minds, and bodies for the ministry of your church. Bless us for the work of your kingdom and give us wisdom to shine our light in all the spaces most needed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The best part about communion is it all has to be consumed, so it will come downstairs with us. (laughs) My friends, in celebration, let us sing our sending hymn, This Little Light of Mine, number 525. Today, tomorrow, and forever.